All right, I got to start this video off. Uh, just, I don't know, however I'm starting this video off, I guess. Uh, yesterday, I tried. I, I wanted to continue this streak that I was on, of which for me, uh, three days in a row of reading anything uh, would be a streak. But I really wanted to continue on with Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Uh, yeah, so I, I really did. But for some reason, I don't know, I was in a... I was in a foul mood yesterday and I just, I wasn't in the right frame of mind and I was kind of probably just reading this with the wrong lens and and I just, I, I thought, you know what, let me hold off until today uh, and I'm going to revisit this now. I think I'm, I'm, I'm chill. It's Friday. I'm hoping I can try not to think about work over the weekend, uh, but that's that's been tough lately. So continuing on, uh, we're part one, chapter one, whatever you want to call this, part one uh, of Green Lights, we're on page 37 now. Second in line to the privilege of my dad's methods of turning his boys into men was Pat. Over the past 40 years, while Rooster has been chasing a career in the oil business in West Texas, and I've been chasing one in Hollywood, Pat has been the fiercely loyal hardest of the family, the one who's always stayed closest to mom, Growing up, he looked after me, took up for me, let me hang out with his friends, introduced me to rock and roll, taught me how to golf, how to drive, how to ask a girl out on a date, and bought me my first beer. Pat was my hero. His was Evil Knievel. Pat's night with Dad came on a Friday in the early spring of 1969, eight months before I was magically born. Dad was out at Fred Smithers hunting camp with some friends a couple hours drive from home. Their night's entertainment had segued into who could piss over whose head the highest. Each man from shortest to tallest would stand on the barn wall, put a mark over his head, and the rest of them would see if they could flat foot piss over the mark. Dad won. When he was the only man who could piss six feet four inches high, the mark he'd just put over his own head. The prize? Bragging rights. But Dad wasn't the tallest man in the barn that night. At six foot seven inches tall, Fred Smither was. And even though Dad had already won the contest, he had to see if he could piss over Fred's head. Fred stood up, marked the wall. Come on, Big Jim, you can do it. His buddies cheered. Pop chugged another beer, leaned back, and let it fly. Nope. 6'4 was as high as he could piss. I knew it. Knew you couldn't piss over my head, Big Jim. Hell, nobody can do that, Fred Smither declared. To which Dad quickly replied, My boy can. Shit, Jim ain't no way your boy or anyone else can piss over my head, Fred sneered. Like hell he can't. What do you want to bet? What do you want to bet? Dad eyed a used Honda XR80 dirt bike leaning against the hail bale in the corner of the barn. You see, Pat had been asking for a dirt bike for Christmas all year long, but Dad knew he couldn't afford one, used or not. I'll bet you that little dirt bike over there my boy can piss over your head, Fred. The gang all cracked up at the proposition. Fred looked at the dirt bike, then back to Dad and said, Deal, and if, you, and if he don't, you owe me $200. I ain't got $200 to lose, Fred, but if my boy can't piss over your head, then you can keep my truck, Dad said. Deal, Fred replied. Deal? I'll be back with my boy by sunrise. Don't y'all go to bed on me. And with that, Dad hopped into his beat-up pickup truck and drove 112 miles back to our house in Uvalde, Uvalde, I think, to pick up Pat. Wake up, little buddy, wake up, Dad said as he quit quietly shook Pat from his slumber. Put a coat and some shoes on. We're going somewhere. Eight-year-old Pat got out of bed, put on a pair of tennis shoes and a coat over his tidy whities then headed for the bathroom. No, no, son. I need you to hold it. Dad said as he rushed Pat out the door. Dad drove Pat 112 miles back to Fred Smithers' hunting camp and made him drink two beers on the way. When, he fi when they finally got to the camp at 4.40 in the morning, Pat's bladder was full of potential. Dad, I really gotta go bad. I know, son. Just hold it for a few more minutes. Dad and Pat, in his tennis shoes, coat and tidy whities walked into the barn. 
The boy had quieted down, but they were still awake. The boys had quieted down, but they were still awake. Fred Smither, too. Boys, this is my son, Pat, and he's about to piss over Fred's head. They all broke out in laughter again. Game on. Fred sauntered over the pissing wall, stood up tall, and chalked a fresh line above his head. All six foot seven inch seven six ugh, all six foot seven of his height. What's going on, Daddy? Pat asked. You see that mark on the wall Mr. Fred just left? Yes, sir. Think you can piss over it? Hell yeah, Pat replied. Then dropped his tidy whities below his knees, put both hands on his pecker, and aimed the mark at uh, aimed the mark and let it fly. Pat cleared Fred Smithers' six seven mark by two feet. That's my boy. I told y'all my boy could piss over Fred's head. Dad hustled over to the corner of the barn, grabbed the Honda XR80, and rolled it over to Pat. Merry Christmas, son. Then they loaded it in the back of Dad's truck, hopped in, and drove 112 miles back home just in time for breakfast. Fourteen years later, Pat became the number one golfer on the Mississippi Delta State Statement statesman golf team a scratch golfer known as the texas stallion pat just won low medalist at the sec tournament on the arkansas razorbacks home course the coach called a team meeting on the bus ride home tomorrow morning my house 8 a.m sharp the next morning coach gathered the team around gathered around him in his living room and said i have a concern that some players on our team were smoking marijuana in the city park of little rock yesterday before the tournament now what we need to do is find out who it was that brought the marijuana from delta state to little rock and who was smoking it he was staring at pat pat raised pat raised by my dad to know that telling the truth would save your ass step forward coach it was me i brought the weed and i smoked it Pat stood there alone. None of the other teammates moved or said a word, even though three of them had passed a doobie with him the other morning in Little Rock. Nobody else, Coach asked? Nothing. I'll let you know what my decision is tomorrow, Coach said. You're dismissed. The next morning, Coach showed up at Pat's dorm room. I'm telling your father, and you're suspended from playing golf for the next semester. Pat caught his breath. Come on, Coach. I told you the truth. And I'm the best golfer on the team. Doesn't matter, Coach said. You broke a team rule about drugs. You're suspended. And I'm going to tell your father. Look here, Coach, Pat said. You can suspend me, but you can't tell my dad. You understand? A DWI, you could call him about. But marijuana? He'll kill me. Pat had gotten busted with a weed, got busted with weed a couple times in his late teens. And after being on the receiving end of Dad's brand of discipline and disdain for Mary Jane before, he was going to make sure that there wasn't a third. Well, that'll be between you and him. Coach didn't budge. Pat inhaled deeply. Okay, Coach, let's go for a ride. They got in Pat's 81Z28 and headed out for a drive across Delta. After about 10 minutes of silence, Pat finally spoke up. Let me make this real clear, Coach. You can suspend me. But if you tell my dad, I'll kill you. Pat got suspended. My dad never found out. Man. I don't really know what to say about that. Um, part of me was wondering why we're even talking about this, you know? Like, what's, what's the necessity of this uh, in regards to this book? But... Even if it was just to tell a story that really uh, was pretty incredible. Um, <laughs> true or not, doesn't matter. It's a story, and a good story is a good story either way. As I said, I was an unplanned surprise. An accident, as my mom still calls me. And my dad has always half-jokingly told her, That ain't my boy, Katie. That's your boy. Dad was on the road a lot when I was growing up, working to take care of the family. So I spent most of the time with mom. It was true, I was a mama's boy. When I did get to spend time with dad, I relished every moment. I wanted and needed his approval. And on occasion, he gave it to me. Other times, he rearranged my considerations in extremely colorful ways. As a kid, 
My favorite TV show was The Incredible Hulk, starring Lou Ferrigo, Ferrigno. I marveled at his muscles and would pose in front of the TV with my shirt off, arms bent, fists high, doing my best bulging bodybuilder biceps impersonation. One night, my dad saw me. What are you doing, son? He asked. One day I'm going to have muscles like that, dad. I said, motioning to the TV screen. Big baseball-sized base biceps. Dad chuckled, then took off his shirt, matched my pose in front of the tube and said, yeah, big biceps make the girls scream and they sure look good. But that old boy on the TV, he's so muscle bound he can't even reach around to wipe his own ass. The biceps, they're just there for the show. He then slowly lowered both of his arms in front of him, straightened them out with fists to the floor. Then he twisted his arms to the inside and flexed a pair of massive tricep muscles. Now the tricep, son, he said, this time pointing his nose back and forth toward the bulging muscles on the back of his upper arms. That's the work muscle. That's the muscle that puts food on the table and the roof over your head. The triceps, they're for dough. My dad would take the stockroom over the showroom any day. It was the summer of 1979 when my dad moved mom, me, and pop from Uvalde, Texas, population of 12,000, to the fastest growing oil boom East Texas city in the nation, Longview, population 76,000. Where Uvalde taught me to deal, Longview taught me to dream. Like everyone else, we moved for the money. Dad was still a pipe salesman and Longview was the place to make it rich in the drilling business. Soon after arriving in town, Pat went away to golf camp and mom went on an extended vacation at a beach house in Navarre Beach, Florida. Rooster, already a multimillionaire in his mid-twenties, had moved to Midland, Texas. So it was just dad and me living in a double wide trailer on the outskirts of town. My dad could hurt with his hands, but he could also heal with them. Painkillers were no match for his hands on my mom's head when she had migraines. Whether it was a broken arm or a broken heart, dad's hands and his hugs could heal, especially when, his, when in service of an underdog or someone who couldn't help themselves, an underdog or someone who couldn't help themselves. The other inhabitant of that double wide trailer dad and I were living in that summer was a pet cockatiel named Lucky. Dad loved that bird and that bird loved dad. He'd open her cage each morning and let her fly around the trailer. She'd roost on his shoulder while he walked around and perch on his forearm while he petted her. He talked to Lucky. Lucky talked to him. When only put, We only put Lucky back in her cage at night to sleep. The rest of the time, Lucky was loose in the trailer morning until night. The only rule was... You had to watch it when you excited or entered the door so Lucky didn't get out. One late afternoon, after a July day of exploring the countryside on foot, I got back to the trailer at the same time as Dad got home from work. When we got inside, Lucky wasn't there to greet Dad like she always did. He looked all over. No Lucky. Shit. I thought, did I accidentally let her out this morning when I left? Did anyone else come over today while we were gone? Seconds later, I heard Dad in the back of the trailer. Oh, goodness. I changed that. Sorry, I'm not going to say it. Oh, no. Lucky. I ran to the back and found Dad on his knees, leaning over the toilet. There, floating in circles in the bottom of it, was Lucky, tears dripping off of his cheeks. Dad reached with both hands into the bottom of the bowl and gently called out Lucky. Oh, no, Lucky. He groaned through sobs. Lucky was dead, soaking wet, motionless. She must have accidentally fallen into the toilet and got stuck beneath the seat, seat's edge, trying to get out. What? <sighs> okay. Alright. Dad still weeping brought Lucky's soggy and lifeless body closer to his face where he examined her hanging head. Then he opened his mouth widely and slowly put Lucky into, a, into it until the bottom half of her wings and her feathers were all outside of it. He started to give Lucky mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Only breathing through his nose 
so to keep constant airflow into her lungs. He made sure his breath was measured, enough, he hopes, to revive her, but not so much to burst her tiny lungs. On his knees, over a toilet, cradling the bottom half of a cocktail named Lucky, with the top half of the name bird, the same bird in his mouth, he breathed into her the perfect amount of pressure. One exhale, two exhale, three, ex three exhales. His tears soaking the already saturated bird. Four exhales, five, a feather quivered. Six exhales, seven, a wingtip fluttered. Eight, dad lightly loosened his grip and released some pressure from his lips. Nine, another wing tried to flap. He opened his mouth slightly wider. Ten, and that's when we heard, coming from the inside of my father's mouth, a small chirp. Now, with tears of pain turning to tears of joy, Dad gently removed Lucky's torso and head from his mouth. Lucky twitched some, some toilet water and saliva off her head. Now, face to face, they looked at each other's eyes. She was dead. Now, she was alive. Lucky lived another eight years. That same summer, while Dad went, was at work every day, I explored the endless acres of piney woods, barefoot and shirtless, wearing a chamois robed around my waist with my Daisy BB gun in my hand. Daisy BB gun. Coming from Uvalde, I've never seen trees like this, towering pines shooting straight up into the sky, thousands of them. I was in awe of one particular, a white pine among the Pandero Ponderosa, six feet wide at its base, its peak trespassing the airspace. Um, I realized I didn't really read that long. This is, only, this is probably going to be the shortest video that I've made so far, uh, and we will come back. We're on page 47 here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. I, I'm struggling with this book, and I, you know... I don't know why I'm struggling with it. It's it's almost like I was expecting something different. And and I said when I started reading this, I was like, I'm not going to go into this with any expectations. You know, I don't want to think this is going to be something because it might not be. I just want to appreciate it for what it is. And I feel like uh, that's not what I'm doing right now. So I'm struggling with it. But, but we're going to keep pressing forward and I'm going to continue to read this because I really do feel like there's going to be something in here that I need to hear. It might it might have been something I already heard. I don't even know at this point. Uh, but until next time, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep moving forward. I will always trust process. And I'll talk to you all later. I'm out. Peace.